<clears throat> okay, on page uh, L3, at the very top, so uh, we're uh, describing the internal plumbing of a female. Last time we finished off by describing the uh, external plumbing, and we call that area that is exposed on the outside of a woman's body the vulva, and we talked about the clitoris and the labia minora, the urethral orifice, the vaginal orifice, the hymen, and so on. So now we're talking about the internal plumbing. And we mentioned the ovaries. Now the ovaries have two functions, just like the testes that we spoke of last time had two functions. You recall that the function of the testes was, number one, to produce sperm, and number two, to secrete the male sex hormone testosterone. We covered that last time. The two functions of the ovaries, very similarly, is the development of ovarian follicles. Now, an ovarian follicle is this structure containing the egg, or ovum. So I've drawn a picture of an ovarian follicle. We'll see a better picture of this in a moment. Uh, each ovarian follicle consists of an ovum or egg surrounded by what are called follicle cells. And it's actually those follicle cells surrounding the egg that secrete the hormones. So when we say that a woman's ovaries secrete hormones, as we tried to learn how to think in this course, we know that, it, that, that the, the body, body doesn't do something, it's the cells of our body that does stuff. Everything is explained at the cellular level. So when we say the ovaries of a woman secrete estrogen and progesterone, it's tr actually these follicle cells that secrete the estrogen and the uh, progesterone. Anyhow, what causes, what activates the development of these ovarian follicles in the ovaries of a woman is this hormone released from the pituitary gland called FSH, follicle stimulating <laughs> hormone. Without FSH, the ovaries of a woman do not develop an ovarian follicle. Just as we learned last time, FSH is what stimulates the production of sperm in the testes of a guy. The second function of the ovaries is the secretion of estrogen and progesterone in the blood into the bloodstream. And as we just said, it is actually these follicle cells that do that secreting. <clears throat> now, uh, the fallopian tubes are also known as the oviducts. That is the location where an egg, an ovum, is normally fertilized by the sperm. In other words, fertilization or conception does not occur in the uterus. In fact, it occurs in the fallopian tubes if it's going to occur at all. And then I mention uh, this, uh, you probably have heard this expression of a woman tying her tubes, technically called a tubal ligation. We'll show you a picture to help you better understand that. The purpose of that is to prevent getting pregnant again. It is really the procedure that corresponds to what a vasectomy is in a guy. That's what a tubal ligation is in a woman. And we talked about a vasectomy last time. Now, the uterus or womb, uh, we'll show you where that is. That's, of course, where the baby develops. The bottom of the uterus is known as the cervix. And uh, the cervix is significant for a few reasons, including the fact that the bottom of the uterus, called the cervix, is one of the more common places where cancer may occur in women. And when it does, that's called cervical cancer. Last class meeting, we learned that one of the more common places where cancer occurs in men is the prostate gland. So, in fact, it's not just coincidence that cancer tends to occur in these reproductive structures. And I hope that we'll yet explain why that is uh, before we're done with the course. Now, uh, what is a pap smear? The, the real word pap is really an abbreviation of the word papanicolau. You don't have to know that. That's basically the name of a gynecologist, a, a, a Greek-born American, Greek-American gynecologist named Dr. Papa Nicolau developed a test for cervical cancer that is known as a pap smear. And this is where some of the cells of the cervix are examined under the microscope to see if a woman has cervical cancer. So uh, certainly for the final, 
uh, both men and women in this class should know that a pap smear is not a test for pregnancy, and it's not a test, that so many people, even women think that, it's not a test for sexually transmitted disease, it is a test for cervical cancer. Um, in terms of the uterus, the inner lining of the uterus is called the endometrium. Metrium means uterus, endo means on the inside. And that's where blood vessels grow, in the inside of the uterus, the endometrium. The outer layer of the uterus is called the myometrium. The Greek root myo means muscle. So this outer muscular wall of the uterus uh, is capable of contracting. And so the myometrium, in fact, contracts during childbirth, and that's called labor contractions. And the last of these terms here, a hysterectomy. A hysterectomy is the clinical word for the surgical removal of the uterus. And there are many reasons why a woman might have to have her uterus removed, but certainly one of the reasons, out of many, is cervical cancer, cancer of the lower part of the uterus. All right, now that we've uh, kind of gone through those terms, let's look at a picture to help us better understand this. Let's look on page L8. L8. And, uh, just as we asked you to know, a picture uh, on L6 showing the internal plumbing of a guy for the final, you should know this picture on L8 of the internal plumbing of a woman for the final. Now again, it's all in the form of multiple choice questions. Uh, anyhow, let's just go through the things we've just reviewed with you on uh, page L3. So these are the ovaries right here, right, left ovaries. Uh, the ovary on this side is actually a cutaway view, uh, and we can even see an egg popping out of the ovary. That's called ovulation. Now up here, these are the fallopian tubes. This is a cutaway view of the fallopian tube. Normally, the fallopian tubes are attached to the ovary. The way they, this picture was drawn is it was drawn with the fallopian tubes pulled away from the ovary so you could see the ovary better. But in real life, the fallopian tubes are attached to the ovaries. So when the egg pops out of the ovary, it enters the fallopian tube. Now an egg cannot move on its own. Unlike a sperm, which has a tail or flagellum that allows it to move, an egg cannot move on its own. But a long time ago, when we were learning about cytology or cells, we actually learned that the cells on the inside lining of the fallopian tube possess cilia. And those cilia act to move and push that egg or embryo uh, in the direction of the uterus, because the egg or the embryo cannot move on its own. Now, the egg that's ovulated only lives about five days only lives about five days and then it dies. We have cells that die all the time in our body. We spoke of this last time. We said sperm live a couple of months and then they die in the epididymis if they're not ejaculated. Uh, we know that red blood cells and white blood cells die and that's why we make new ones all the time. We make new skin cells. So there's nothing weird about cells dying. And, uh, so the egg only lives about five days and during that time it's being pushed through the fallopian tube. It is during those five days where a woman can get pregnant. She can't get pregnant when the egg is still inside of her ovaries, and that egg only lives about five days, and really by the time that egg reaches the uterus, which is about one week after it was ovulated, the egg is already dying. So by the time that egg reaches the uterus, it's dying. So fertilization, the uniting of a sperm with an egg, if it's going to happen and result in an embryo, it's got to occur in the fallopian tube. If the egg is fertilized by a sperm, it will form an em a zygote, which develops into an embryo, and that embryo will implant in the inner lining of the uterus called the endometrium. And that's where blood vessels are growing. Notice this inner lining where the blood vessels grow is labeled the endometrium. The thick outer wall was labeled the myometrium. That's the muscular wall. Myo means muscle. The bottom of the uterus opens to the vaginal or vaginal canal, and the, it is called the cervix. And that is, uh, not only does the cervix dilate or widen during childbirth,
But we've said that the cervix, the bottom of the uterus, is one of the more common places where cancer may occur in women. All right, so I've just described that picture. What I'd now like to do is to describe a little bit about what FSH and LH do in the ovaries. We originally talked about this last class meeting, and you wrote what FSH and LH do to the ovaries on page L1. So I'll let you go back and review that. Remember, we're, all, we're just literally a, a week and a half away from the final. The best advice I have ever given you from the very beginning of this course, and I still give it to you right now, the best way to succeed in college, not only in a college biology class or any other college course, is study every day. Don't procrastinate. And it's, you've got a week and a half to change your habits. All right? And the final is worth 40% of the course grade, almost one half of the course grade. So if it were me, and I didn't want to retake this course, I would be studying every single day. Because the alternative is, you'll get to see me again in the phone, all right, or somebody else. Anyhow, um, so let's summarize what, uh, the, what happens in the ovary. This is an enlarged view of the ovary. And basically what happens is this. There are two hormones that are released from the pituitary gland. One is called FSH and the other is called LH, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. They're listed on L1. All right? Now, the pituitary gland in women releases FSH for two weeks, and then it switches and releases LH for two weeks. Now, the two weeks during which uh, the pituitary gland releases FSH extends from basically day one, and I wrote the word day one right here, and two weeks after that is day 14. And day 14, what occurs around day 14, that's two weeks after day one, is ovulation. So FSH is released for these two weeks between day one and day 14. This period of this first two weeks is called the pre-ovulatory phase. And that makes a lot of sense to call it pre-ovulatory because those are the two weeks before ovulation. Pre means before. What does FSH cause to happen? FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, stimulates the growth of an ovarian follicle. It starts out small, and this hormone from the pituitary gland causes one of the ovarian follicles, and there are thousands of them in the woman's ovaries. It causes one of them to develop and grow bigger. Now, it's believed that uh, FSH normally just causes one ovarian follicle to grow each cycle. And uh, a woman has two ovaries, and it's believed that the ovaries kind of alternate. So if one month, one cycle, FSH causes one of the ovarian follicles in her right ovary to develop, the next cycle or next month, FSH will cause an ovarian follicle in her left ovary to develop. What if... FSH actually caused more than one ovarian follicle to grow and develop at the same month, then it's possible she might ovulate more than one egg and end up with multiple births, right? So uh, we'll have more to say about that. Now, not only does FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, cause the growth of this ovarian follicle, but it causes the follicle cells surrounding that egg or ovum to secrete estrogen, just like I wrote here. So an ovarian follicle is, looks like this. It consists of an egg surrounded by follicle cells. FSH from the pituitary gland causes one of the ovarian follicles in a woman's two ovaries to grow bigger. It stimulates its growth, and it causes the follicle cells to secrete estrogen. Now, beginning on day 14, beginning on day 14, the pituitary gland switches and starts releasing LH rather than FSH. So for the next two weeks, the pituitary gland releases luteinizing hormone. So this goes from day 14 until day 28. And so let me just write, I'll write to day 28 on here, just so we can see it. So I'll put day 28 right here. 
shows up. All right, so LH is going to be released for two weeks. 14 plus 14 is 28. That's two weeks. So we call these two, so what does LH do? What does LH do? Luteinizing hormone secreted by the pituitary gland causes ovulation. That's what causes the egg to pop out. And then LH still continues to stimulate. Now, let me just say this. When the egg pops out, where does it go? It enters the fallopian tube, and for the next five days, a woman can get pregnant. Now, after the egg pops out of this ovarian follicle, then what we have left are just follicle cells without any egg inside it. Does everybody follow this? This, with the egg surrounded by follicle cells, is called an ovarian follicle. Without the egg, it's called a corpus luteum. That's what we call it, a corpus luteum. And so, you say, what's a corpus luteum again? That's an ovarian follicle after the egg pops out. It is basically just made up of follicle cells. LH is what caused the egg to pop out. That's called ovulation. And LH causes these follicle cells of the corpus luteum to secrete progesterone now into the woman's bloodstream. Now, we learned about progesterone a long time ago back in section D, page D4. Pro, uh, I'm sorry, D3. Progesterone is the hormone that progest. That means to prepare for gestation, to prepare for pregnancy. And one of the things that progesterone causes in terms of preparing a woman's body for pregnancy is it stimulates the growth of blood vessels in the endometrial lining of her uterus. So blood vessels start to grow in the endometrial lining. So you'll notice what's happened. LH caused the egg to pop out, so now the egg is moving down the fallopian tube. And LH is stimulating these follicle cells of the corpus luteum to secrete progesterone hormone into the woman's bloodstream, which is causing blood vessels to grow in the endometrial lining of her uterus. Her uterus, her womb, is getting ready in case this egg is fertilized, in case she has conception, in case she gets pregnant. Because if she does get pregnant, then there will be blood vessels to nourish that embryo when it implants. Now, we're what we're going to be learning is that if she does get pregnant, these blood vessels will nourish the embryo. But what if she doesn't get pregnant? What if she's not even having sex? What if, uh, even if she has sex, what if that egg doesn't get fertilized? If she doesn't get pregnant, then the blood vessels that developed will be shed. These blood vessels will be shed out the uterus and out the vaginal canal. And this loss of blood and fluid out the vaginal canal is called menstruation, or having a period. So having a period is literally the shedding of these blood vessels because the woman didn't get pregnant. Many years ago, I was reading a book in physiology of the uh, uh, human reproductive system written in the 19th century, that means the 1800s, and they described a period, a woman having her period, menstruating, as her womb, her uterus, her womb, crying because she didn't get pregnant. Because basically the womb is crying, it sheds those vessels. All right? That's really, if a woman has a period, she may find the period process uncomfortable and so on, but it means she's not pregnant. Because the classic indication that a sexually active woman, a woman who's engaging in intercourse, the first thing that she might indicate she might be pregnant is she's, her womb's not crying. She's not having her period. The common expression is she's late in having her period, and if that period and that shedding of the vessels doesn't occur, in all probability, she is pregnant because her womb's not shedding those vessels. So that's what's going on. That's what a period is. So, uh, in, in summarizing this picture right here, FSH is released from the pituitary gland uh, uh, for two weeks, and it causes the growth of an ovarian follicle. It's called follicle-stimulating hormone. 
and it causes the follicle cells to secrete estrogen hormone. This is for two weeks. Beginning around day 14, for the next two weeks, until approximately day 28, these dates are approximate, could be day 29 or day 30 or 27, but for the next two weeks, LH is released from the pituitary and it causes the egg to pop out and it causes the follicle cells of what is now referred to as the corpus luteum to secrete progesterone. And progesterone is the hormone that we learned about a long time ago on D3, prepares a woman's body for a possible pregnancy, progestation. And that includes the growth of blood vessels. If she gets pregnant, those blood vessels will nourish the baby. If she doesn't get pregnant, those blood vessels will be shed, and that's called having a period or menstruating. And then the whole cycle begins all over again. FSH is released for two weeks, and a new ovarian follicle grows. Just try the whole thing all over again. Uh -huh. Do those uh, blood vessels become the placenta? No. Placenta develops from the baby. Now, uh, let's show you another diagram that shows the same thing that I've referred to, uh, just in a different form. So, I, I think this uh, is a very descriptive picture. Here's what it shows. All right? So, at the very top, it is showing the pituitary gland, that gland that is attached to your brain. And it shows that in women, and, uh, the pituitary gland releases FSH, and I wrote that it's released for two weeks. Let me enlarge that just so we can zero in on what's happening right here. So the pituitary releases FSH for two weeks, and then it releases LH for two weeks. So assuming a woman isn't getting pregnant, it's just kind of alternating. Now what does FSH do? FSH causes an ovarian follicle, which is small, to grow larger. Now, I'm not, I'm not asking you to know these names, primary, secondary, graphene follicle. Just want you to see how that ovarian follicle grew bigger. And FSH not only causes one of those ovarian follicles to grow, it causes the follicle cells to secrete estrogen. That's exactly what we had written right here. FSH causes the follicle cells to secrete estrogen. Now, at the bottom of this picture, this is showing, in the bottom, it says endometrial changes during the menstrual cycle. You'd say, what the hell does that mean? That means changes in the endometrial lining of the womb. And you'll notice that what it shows at the bottom is it shows the days of a woman's cycle. Day 1, day 4, day 8, day 12, day 14, day 16, day 20, day 24, day 28. Now, uh, we said that a woman's menstrual cycle lasts about 28 days. That's four weeks. Seven days in a week, four times seven, seven days in a week is 28 days, about one month. That's approximate. Some women... If they, it, uh, it varies a great deal. Other women, it's more consistent, but it may be uh, 27 days or 31 days each cycle. It's just approximately 28 days. Now, what is day one? What is day one of a cycle? Now, today happens to be May 21st. So does that mean that every woman on planet Earth is on the tw day 21 of her cycle? No. Not at all. Every woman has her own biorhythm. There are women today who are on day 21 of their cycle. There are women who are on day 1 of their cycle. There are women on day 12 of their cycle. There are women on day 28 of their cycle. Each woman has her own particular biorhythm or cycle. So each woman has nothing to do with the date on the calendar. It has to do with her own biorhythm of her body. All right, so what is our definition of day 1? Day one, now when they wanted to create this cycle, we, and they were learning about it, they wanted a woman to be able to tell what, at some point in her cycle. And the point in a woman's cycle that is most obvious to her is the first day she starts to have her period, where there is shedding of some of the endometrial lining out the vaginal canal, where her period begins. 
So the definition of day one is the first day that a woman notices menstruation or shedding of the endometrial lining. That is the definition of day one. It's the most obvious point in her cycle. So a woman begins day one of her cycle with the first day of menstruation. And she typically will shed that endometrial lining for several days. So it lasts a few days. And here it shows that the endometrial lining is being shed. It's getting thinner. And it's coming out the vaginal canal. Now, uh, we had said that uh, FSH is released for two weeks. It causes an ovarian follicle to grow. It causes the follicle cells of the ovarian follicle to secrete estrogen. And so that's basically the first two weeks. The first two weeks of the cycle is known as the pre-ovulatory phase. It makes a lot of sense. The word pre-ovulatory means before ovulation. It's also sometimes called the follicular phase because it involves this ovarian follicle. So the follicular or pre-ovulatory phase. Now, we had said that beginning around day 14, let's look at day 14. Here it says day 14. That's the halfway point in this 28-day cycle. Draw a line straight up. And if you draw a line straight up, what do you notice should happen approximately on day 14? Ovulation. And what caused ovulation was LH from the pituitary gland. There is, the pituitary stops releasing FSH and it starts, really switches to releasing LH into the bloodstream. There's a so-called surge in the LH level in the bloodstream and that rise in the LH hormone level in a woman's bloodstream is what causes the egg to pop out of her ovary. That's ovulation. In fact, we'll see in a moment that they have kits that you can buy in a drugstore. Not only are there pregnancy test kits, which I'll explain in a, a shortly, there are ovulation test kits, which a woman can use to determine when she ovulates. All of these test kits, the pregnancy test kit, the ovulation test kit, are based on detecting hormones in a woman's urine. Any hormone that is in the bloodstream, small amounts will even appear in, in the uh, urine, not only in a, a woman, but in a guy too. So if a woman takes a sample of her urine, she, she can take this test device, a test strip, and put it in her urine. And in this case, the ovulation test kit is sensitive to LH. So if she puts this strip into her urine and there's no LH, all right, she hasn't ovulated yet. Let's imagine the next day she takes a fresh sample of urine and a new test strip, dips it in the urine. Now, nope, there's still no LH. It didn't change color. Usually these little test strips change color. Let's say the next day goes, it happens. She takes a new fresh sample of urine, puts a new test strip in, and <gasps> it changed color. There's LH in her urine. If there's LH in her urine, there's LH in her bloodstream. If there's LH in her bloodstream, what's the first thing that LH causes to happen? Ovulation. Ovulation. So she didn't have LH yesterday in her urine or in her bloodstream. She does now. So that means she's about to ovulate or has just ovulated. Now, why would a woman want to know when she's ovulated? For one of two reasons. Either she wants to get pregnant or doesn't want to get pregnant. Because now that she's ovulated, she knows she can get pregnant. She couldn't get pregnant until she detected LH, which causes the egg to pop out of her ovary and enter the fallopian tube. Now, while a woman could use this method and say, oh, I've now ovulated, so I'm not going to engage in intercourse, in fact, the most common reason why women buy this ovulation test kit is for those couples who are trying to have a baby. Because I said there's only five days in the entire 28-day cycle where a woman can actually get pregnant. For the, after, for the five days immediately after she ovulates. So in fact, while it's always, we always know stories of a, a, a couple who had sex once and the woman ends up pregnant, we also know that there are married couples who've been trying to have a child for months. And before the doctors resort to fertility drugs and, and medical procedures and in vitro fertilization, 
they first want to make sure, is the couple having intercourse at the optimal time to get pregnant? Because it's only for the five days immediately following ovulation. So if a couple is trying to have a, a baby, and they've been trying, so the doctor's going to say, get the ovulation test, get at the drugstore, test your urine, and the moment you see LH in your urine, call them up and say, get the hell over here. <laughs> okay, we're going at it, all right? Because that's the time of the month to go and try to have a baby, all right? Because if you try to do it the two weeks before, then you're not going to get pregnant before ovulation. And after five days, five days after ovulation, it'll be too late. The egg has already died for that cycle. So there's really just this small window of opportunity to get pregnant. Now, LH not only causes ovulation, after the egg pops out of this ovarian follicle, it's called a corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is the name for this, these follicle cells after the egg has popped out. And uh, the, it shows in this diagram how LH is causing the follicle cells of the corpus luteum to secrete progesterone. So it's really causing these follicle cells in the corpus luteum to secrete progesterone and estrogen, but the main emphasis is progesterone. And progesterone causes significant thickening of the endometrial lining. It's what really causes the inner lining of the uterus to grow thicker, and it causes the growth of blood vessels. These are blood vessels growing. That's called vascularization, the growth of vessels, vascularization. And that term, incidentally, goes back to page D3. If you don't believe me, you should go back and review your notes on page D3. That just means growth of vessels. Now, it, uh, one of two things is going to happen. That egg has been ovulated. Either the woman's going to get pregnant or she doesn't. Let's assume she didn't get pregnant. Let's assume she, the egg wasn't fertilized or she's not even having sex. So the pituitary is going to stop releasing LH after two weeks. We said it would only release LH for two weeks. And then I wrote up here on the right that when the pituitary stops releasing LH, you know what's going to happen? That corpus luteum is going to degenerate. You'd say, what does that mean? It's going to shrink in size. It's going to atrophy. So that with, when there's a decrease in LH, the uh, corpus luteum shrinks and it stops secreting progesterone. Now, remember, it was progesterone that caused the growth of the endometrial lining and the growth of blood vessels. So with a decrease in progesterone, there is a shedding of the endometrial lining. So in other words, the drop in the progesterone hormone level causes menstruation. It causes having a period. It was the progesterone hormone that caused the growth of the endometrial lining and blood vessels to form. Without the progesterone, there's a shedding of the endometrial lining. The first day that the woman notices the shedding would be called day one of a new cycle. First day she notices shedding of the endometrial lining. All right, well, I think this diagram is pretty good as far as trying to visualize the story that it is really these two hormones from the pituitary gland that are controlling the ovaries, and it is the ovarian hormones, estrogen and progesterone, that are affecting the womb or uterus. So literally, the pituitary hormones control the ovaries, and the ovarian hormones, estrogen and progesterone, control what the uterus does. Let's go back to page L3. So on L3, now, I never said the menstrual cycle is simple. In fact, I don't think one would say anything about the reproductive systems are simple. For uh, it, it, Guys are simple, certainly simpler than females, but even the guy was complicated. You might remember that last time I said that most college students for that matter, most people in general actually know almost nothing about their reproductive systems, and I think we've proven that, all right? But is this important? 
You know, of the various topics we've covered this entire semester, we're, this could be arguably one of the most important subjects of them all. Because of, well, I understand, you're never going to need to know photosynthesis unless you're a science major, and most of you aren't. You're not even going to need to know about, uh, I don't know, cellular respiration, or for that matter, even fermentation. But all of us will deal with our own reproductive systems and how they work or don't work. And I can't imagine a more relevant subject that if you've completed college to not understand how your own reproductive system works so that when they're discussing some possible issue in the future, you understand what they're referring to. Anyhow, so we wrote on L3, what is the menstrual cycle? It's associated with a periodic shedding of part of the endometrial lining of the uterus. Day one is defined as the first day of menstruating, of shedding part of the endometrial lining out the vaginal canal, having a period, menstruating. It lasts for three to seven days. Now, what is day 14? If the cycle lasts four weeks, 28 days, the midpoint, Day 14 is the approximate date of ovulation. So, now we've got two weeks before ovulation and two weeks after ovulation. The two weeks before ovulation is called the pre-ovulatory or follicular phase. During this time, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone from the pituitary gland, stimulates the growth of an ovarian follicle. And the follicle cells secrete estrogen. Estrogen stimulates feminization, feminization, and some growth of the endometrial lining of the uterus. Ovulation is stimulated by LH from the pituitary gland. We have already described what an ovulation test kit is. It is where you can purchase this kit where you take a sample of urine, a woman can, put a strip in, and see if there's LH in her urine or not. The first day she detects LH in her urine means that she's a, she has an LH surge going on in her body and she's about to ovulate. Now, for the next two weeks after ovulation, that's called the post-ovulatory phase. LH causes the follicle cells, which are now called the corpus luteum, to secrete progesterone and estrogen, but the emphasis is on progesterone into the bloodstream. Progesterone is what stimulates thickening and vascularization of the endometrial lining of the uterus. That's the growth of blood vessels. It also causes a woman's body temperature to go up by about one degree, the uh, progesterone. This is a uh, there's another way of knowing when a woman is at what point in her cycle, and that's by taking her body temperature every morning. That's known as using a, a thermometer in what's known as the rhythm method for knowing when she's, uh, at what point she is in her own cycle. Anyhow, if the what egg... A, professor, what about a, um, a woman that's using an IUD? We're not going to talk about it. Okay, so uh, the, uh, if the ovum is not fertilized, if the ovum is not fertilized in the fallopian tube, if she doesn't get pregnant, the pituitary gland stops secreting LH by day 28. There is a drop in the progesterone hormone level, and that drop in the progesterone hormone level leads to shedding of the endometrial lining or menstrual bleeding. All right? It was the progesterone that caused the growth of blood vessels. And the drop in the progesterone hormone level leads to shedding of those blood vessels. On page L4, what if she did get pregnant? Those are the only two possibilities. And at any given cycle, you either got pregnant or you didn't. There's nothing in between. You don't say, you know, I'm kind of pregnant. <laughs> if the egg was fertilized, and it is fertilized in the fallopian tube, that means there's an embryo that's going to implant in the uterus about one week after fertilization. And the embryo secretes a hormone called chorionic gonadotropin, which can be detected in the mother's bloodstream and in her urine. 
So before I go any further, let's make sure we understand what I just said by looking at page L, actually uh, this is L4, we're going to look at L9. L9. On page L9, so on the top left of L9, and we've looked at this picture before, what does it show? It shows here's the egg popping out of the ovary, entering the fallopian tube, and it shows what's labeled fertilization. A sperm is uniting with that egg. Right? So intercourse has occurred, and when a sperm unites with an egg, it forms a zygote. And that zygote, that fertilized egg, is going to start to develop. And it divides and becomes a two-celled embryo. And those cells divide and becomes a four-celled embryo. All the time, the cells, the ciliated cells lining the fallopian tube are pushing this embryo in the direction of the uterus. Because it can't move on its own. In fact, we've talked about this before. If the ciliated cells didn't work, the embryo would start to just grow right there in the fallopian tube, and that would be called a tubal pregnancy. We ever mentioned that before? Yeah. Right, so we did. So, uh, but normally, of course, they do work, and this becomes a four-celled embryo and an eight-celled embryo. And after about a week after ovulation, about one week after ovulation, now ovulation was day 14, Day 14, so what's a week? What's seven, seven days after day 14? What's seven plus 14? Day 21. So approximately day 21 in a woman's cycle is the approximate time of implantation if she's pregnant. So I'm just trying to give a woman a sense that she's heard of ovulation, and if she gets pregnant, implantation of that embryo occurs about one week after ovulation. So that's day 21. Now, she's still a week before she expects to have her period, which is around day 28. So that embryo implants, and it's going to be nourished by blood vessels in the endometrial lining. Now, as this embryo develops, and this is a much later stage of development, this is a much later stage, but nevertheless, what this shows is here's this embryo, and the embryo is actually surrounded by two sacs. There are actually two sacs surrounding the baby. Two sacs surround the embryo, surround the baby. What are those two sacs? There is an inner sac and an outer sac. The inner sac is called the amnionic sac. The amnionic sac is the inner sac. You can even see it's labeled amnionic cavity. This is filled with fluid. That's the inner sac. There is an outer sac called the chorion or chorionic sac. That's the outer sac. So there's a sac with a, a surrounding a sac, an inner sac surrounded by an outer sac. It's like seeing a balloon with an inner balloon and an outer balloon. So there's the inner amnionic sac and an outer chorionic sac. The outer chorionic sac, now the inner amnionic sac is filled with fluid surrounding the baby. The outer chorionic sac starts to secrete a hormone. That outer chorionic sac secretes a hormone called chorionic gonadotropin. And that hormone secreted by the chorionic sac enters the mother's bloodstream. This goes into the mother's bloodstream. So that's going into the mother's bloodstream. <clears throat> now, it's called chorionic because it's produced by the outer chorionic sac. It's called gonadotropin because it affects the ovaries of the mother. This hormone affects the ovaries of the mother. So in other words, if a woman gets pregnant, instead of her pituitary hormones controlling her ovaries, 
There is this hormone from the baby, from the sac surrounding the baby that will control the mother's ovaries for the duration of the pregnancy. So for, the, if, for as long as this baby is developing and growing in her womb, it will secrete this hormone into the mother's bloodstream and her womb will continue to remain vascularized and she will not have any more menstrual periods for the duration of the uh, of pregnancy. Women who are pregnant don't ovulate, they don't menstruate, they don't have any cycles, they are simply nourishing the baby that is growing within their womb. Why is this happening? How is it being controlled? It's actually the hormone secreted by this outer sac surrounding the baby that is now controlling the mother's reproductive system. So the baby controls the mother's reproductive system for the duration of the pregnancy. Now, in this picture right here, so here is definitely what looks like a pregnant woman, about full term. And all that we're showing is there's this outer chorionic sac, and I tried to show it's secreting CG. You'd say, what's that? Chorionic gonadotropin, in, and it's going into the mother's bloodstream. Eventually, this baby's gonna come out of the vaginal canal. And our thought is, who designed that? Because that looks impossible. Yes. <laughs> when all kids always figure it's got to be the belly button. It makes, as much, it makes as much sense as the vaginal canal. All right, but it's the vaginal canal. Now, so we've been mentioning that chorionic anatotropin is actually secreted by the sac surrounding the baby. So now we can explain how they, what a pregnancy test is. Let's go back to L4. So back on L4, let's reread what we said on L4. If the egg was fertilized in the fallopian tube, the embryo implants in the uterus about one week after fertilization. This is about day 21. The embryo and I wrote embryo, but it's really the sac surrounding the embryo, secretes this hormone called chorionic anatotropin. It's really the sac surrounding the embryo, which can be detected in the mother's bloodstream and her urine. So now we can explain what a pregnancy test kit is. So if a woman thinks maybe I'm pregnant, let me check. So she goes to the drugstore, purchases a pregnancy test kit. And all of these test kits work similarly. I mentioned the ovulation test kit earlier. She would take a sample of her urine. Because if there's any hormones in that urine, there's hormones in the bloodstream and vice versa. And basically there's this little device, a test strip, an instrument you stick in the urine and it's sensitive to this chorionic anatotropin. That's what the pregnancy test kit is. So if there's that hormone in her urine, that means there's that hormone in her bloodstream, that means there's a baby in her. Because the only time there would ever be this hormone is if she's pregnant. They don't test for estrogen or progesterone. Women's ovaries produce estrogen and progesterone every cycle. They want to test for something that would only be in a woman's body if a baby is in her. And what the baby, that sac surrounding the baby produces is a unique hormone called chorionic anatotropin. What does CG, chorionic anatotropin, do? It stimulates the mother's ovaries to keep secreting progesterone for the duration of the entire pregnancy. Because chorionic anatotropin is now controlling the ovaries of the mother, the ovaries will continue to secrete progesterone for the duration of the pregnancy, and therefore there is no shedding of the endometrial lining. There's no period. So the reason why a woman, a woman who's pregnant, the first thing that she notices is she's not having a period. Her womb is not crying. <laughs> And after she does the pregnancy test, she may start to cry, but her, her, her womb is not crying. Now, uh, so we have been describing the menstrual cycle. Now, uh, let me just, uh, uh, I'll just mention uh, a couple of things here. 
Let's go back to L8, back to L8 for just a moment. And on L8, this is page L8 in the lower diagram. So we said that a woman normally ovulates around day 14 of the cycle, the midway point. And the time during which that egg can get fertilized is between around, for the next five days, from around day 14 to day 19, it's just about five, five days, around day 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, it's approximately around there. So the time there a woman is most likely to get pregnant is really right in here. Now, this, so the, it's not likely that if one were, if one were to have, uh, un, uh, if one were to have unprotected sex early in the cycle, you're not likely to get pregnant. However, most couples find it problematic to have sex early in the cycle when a woman is literally bleeding or menstruating. So that's not so optimal. All right, now, it's also pretty safe to have unprotected sex at the end of the cycle, at the end, because that egg only lives a few days, right? So if you have sex, let's say around day 25, 26, 27, and near the end of the cycle, not likely to get pregnant. That egg's probably already died. But some women near the end of their cycle develop irritability. It's commonly called PMS, premenstrual syndrome. Now it varies in women and it varies from cycle to cycle. Basically, there's all these hormonal changes occurring in a woman, especially towards the end of the cycle, and some get bitchy. <laughs> all right? And that's called PMS. And again, sometimes more so in some women than others, sometimes more intense on some cycles than other cycles. So even though it would probably be t pretty safe to have unprotected sex near the end of the cycle, some women have PMS. So you'll notice, early in the cycle, a woman's menstruating. That would be safe. End of the cycle, that'd be safe. But some women have PMS. So you'll notice that basically what's it forcing the couple to have sex is in the middle of the cycle, which is most conducive to trying to get pregnant. So it doesn't always mean you'll get pregnant, but that's kind of the way it works. Furthermore, I want to remind people that the sperm can live in a woman's body for about three days. So if a, let's say a couple had unprotected sex, let's say on day uh, 12 before ovulation, now that should be safe, it hasn't even ovulated yet, but the sperm can live in her body for three days. So then she ovulates on day 14, and the sperm are still there, and she gets pregnant. So it gets kind of, you know, that if you ask what's the safe time, well, again, the further you are towards the beginning or the end of the cycle, the safer it is to have unprotected sex, but it's not so optimal in terms of doing it. All right, now, uh, so I've mentioned uh, back on page L4, I've even mentioned premenstrual syndrome. I didn't use the word bitchy, I said irritability. <laughs> Now, there are a number of differences between men and women, as we can clearly see biologically. <clears throat> In a guy, we had learned, and let's go back to L1, just to remind you. On page L1, we had talked about what FSH and LH do, last class meeting. We said FSH from the pituitary gland causes the testes of a guy to make sperm. LH from his pituitary gland causes the testes of a guy to secrete testosterone. The pituitary gland of a guy secretes FSH and LH at the same time, beginning around the age of 12 or 13 for the rest of his life. So a guy who's 90 years old, is still making sperm and still secreting testosterone. All right? So guys who are 90 years old can, in theory, still father a child. <laughs> All right? That their pituitary continues to release FSH and LH for their entire life, from the time of puberty for the rest of their life. In women, the whole thing is very different. FSH is released for two weeks. 
Then LH is released for two weeks. And it switches back to FSH for two weeks, and then LH for two weeks. So it keeps alternating. So we said that what does FSH do? It causes an ovarian follicle to grow and the release of estrogen. What does LH do? It causes ovulation and causes the corpus luteum to secrete progesterone. Then it switches back to FSH. And the whole thing turns off by around age 50. That's called menopause. So back on page L4, menopause, we wrote on page L4, Menopause is around the age of 50. It's when the ovaries stop working. So basically, after the age of 50, a woman doesn't have menstrual cycles. She doesn't ovulate. She doesn't secrete estrogen or progesterone. This is commonly referred to as the reproductive biological clock in women that guys don't have. <clears throat> Just as another point of emphasizing, and this is really more directed to the guys now, to un help understand women. <laughs> Not only do women deal with the reproductive biological clock that guys don't deal with, women's hormone levels keep changing. They're releasing FSH, which causes estrogen to be released by the ovaries, then it switches to LH, which causes progesterone to be released, then it switches back. Imagine if a guy, this doesn't happen, but imagine if a guy's testosterone levels increased and decreased and increased and decreased. Can you imagine how that would affect you? When you have the testosterone, you feel powerful and strong, and then when these, your, if your testes <laughs> stop releasing it, for a few, then you'd feel weak and please don't hurt me, all right? So guys don't feel that. Every day is pretty much the same as every other day because guys have pretty much a constant level of testosterone. But women constantly are experiencing this rising and falling of their sex hormone levels that affect them. And so guys don't get it because it doesn't happen to them. But that's why I'm saying you can get it by appreciating that if your testosterone levels were rising and falling like a roller coaster all the time, you would understand what women are experiencing. So well, no wonder they feel differently on different days of the month. All right. So when they say it's that time of the month or it's this time of the month, that's what they mean because it really affects their whole body. It affects how they feel. So now they know where that guy told them. That's right. They know that guy told them. You think I explained that pretty well? Yeah, I think you did. All right. So that's the, that's the idea. Yeah. Yes, that's possible because they sometimes say that the most erogenous part of the body is your brain. All right? And so that's really, now this is not so much for other animals, but in the case of human, most of, you know, what's sexy, sexy and turns us on is in our minds and our heads. And so that's the most powerful factor. All right? So more than the hormones. But there are changes. There are physical changes that occur after menopause. So anyhow, that's uh, menopause. Uh, we've already mentioned uh, cervical cancer and testing with a pap smear. Now, I'm not going to talk about contraception. If you're interested, you can read about it. I'm not asked, describing it. I'm not testing on it. Let me say a few comments about it on L4. The word parturition means childbirth. And yes, I'd like you to know that word. So giving birth is called parturition. Parturition means giving birth. Now, in terms of giving birth, so normally, I wrote that the fetus, and we'll define a fetus in a moment, the fetus normally rotates during the seventh month of pregnancy into the head down position. This is called cephalic presentation. Cephalic presentation means that the baby is in the head down position. I always call that the blast-off position, right? So the baby, most babies, for the first seven months, are kind of oriented horizontally in the womb. And around the seventh month, they, on their own, start to rotate into the head down, or what I call the blast-off position. If the baby fails to rotate into the head down position, we say they're breech. And that means that if the baby were to start to come out, the birth canal, the vaginal canal, it would be a foot coming out first, or an arm. 
And they don't try. In the old days, they used to pull on a foot or pull on an arm, and they just hurt the baby. So now, if the baby is breached, they do a C-section. That means an abdominal incision where they go through the abdomen and through the wall of the uterus, and they deliver the baby out through the abdomen rather than coming out the birth canal. Yes? Do they try really quickly to rotate the baby? First? If they can, but it's you know pretty difficult to get that arm up you know, there and rotate it. So there's only, they're not going to try too much. They're going to do a C-section. Now, on page L5, on L5, so I mentioned on L5, so a, what is a C-section? It is the removal of a child through an abdominal incision. There are a number of causes. The only one that I've specifically mentioned here is being breech, meaning it's not in the head down position. We'll show you a picture of that in a moment. Now, we use these terms embryo and fetus. And I do want you to know that beginning with the ninth week, when the embryo becomes nine weeks old, we start to call it a fetus. Now, this is really more for legal purposes than biological or medical, because biologically, medically, it's all one continuous process. But there are things that change legally when the uh, embryo becomes a fetus, uh, in terms of things that can or can't be done. Uh, let's talk about, and I'm not going to get into the, what the events of the tri three trimesters. You can see that all this stuff is really kind of important, and maybe even somewhat interesting. Uh, and none of it is simple. 